my name is Victor Duran. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about 5G, uh, how it's connected to microservices and how it's connected to IoT. So a little bit about me. I grew up in southern Spain, uh, which means I take to exaggerate a lot. Uh, then I moved to Sweden, and uh, I'm, how to say, as chatty as uh, the people from, I forgot the name of the city that somebody told me, but it's from south part of Taiwan. I, I talk a lot, too much. I started in 2002 with Java 1.3, and although I'm from Spain, I do not fight the bulls. Uh, the relationship between Taiwan and Spain is uh, mainly cultural, so we have many illustrators from Taiwan in Spain, and uh, how to say we share also a common breakfast, the jutiao or churros in Spain. So um, I would like to go back a little bit on time. I don't know if when Internet of Things came to to the, like different parts of the world. The, there was a huge hype, the people were talking about smart homes, smart cars, all kind of things. And, uh, well, pretty much of this didn't happen, or it didn't really came to, to any place very much. Uh, but what it did happen is that now factories are getting smart. So, for example, when Volvo produces a car, in the past they produced the entire car and then they put a SIM card. Now what they're doing is that the minute that you have a chassis, you put a SIM card and you start collecting data from the production. So even before the car has left the factory, it's producing data for the manufacturer. Uh, and usually, in the past, they had one SIM card. Now the cars come with five SIM cards. And they are uh, usually uh, made in the, how to say, uh, embedded SIM cards, not the same ones as phone. The other thing has changed is that, for example, this uh, IoT allows uh, companies to run hardware in the middle of difficult places. So in Africa, there is a Danish company called Grundforge that charge, builds, maintains, and repair water pumps in the desert for communities they couldn't get water otherwise. And uh, what the IoT is going to do is actually push 5G in, in the entire world. So IoT right now, it's uh, the main driver why they're trying to connect everything uh, through, the voice, this, through the SIM cards. And the predictions are that right now we have 6.4 billion devices connected. By 2024, it's going to be 20 billion devices, which means that everything that you can see will have somehow an embedded SIM card. In the case of uh, Taiwan, the Chunghua is uh, going to deploy their network next year. So when we as developers talk to about this network, we usually tend to not care. Like we see internet as a just HTTP, maybe FTP, and we don't really see what this, what it, I mean, nobody noticed the difference between 3G and 4G from the cell phone. Like you, you create your app, you send data, and you don't care. Uh, in the case of 5G, it's a little bit special. So there are many differences that are gonna come and one of them is that the, the basically all the hardware in the telecom operator is going to get virtualized. So this allows a great flexibility for you as a developer to get the resources you need for, for more complicated applications. Then the part, second part is that they're going to try to partition architectures and services. So you have an old legacy system and you need to move to something new then you don't need to change everything. You keep the old part and slowly start migrating to new services. And the other th difference is that in the 4G, the latency is not very good. Uh, it's, it can be further improved. So the 5G networks are going to have super fast latency. Uh, and that usually is under the 10 microseconds. And also, of course, security is very important. The other thing that's going to change is how devices move. So once you have a car, the next thing is a train and an airplane and all these kind of things. So 5G has to support high speed. The other thing is the energy. Since everything is going to be connected, the energy consumption is very important. And this needs to be further improved to become very efficient. So the, the final goal is to have like ubiquitous high speed everywhere you go. 
So it shouldn't be any difference if you are in downtown Taipei or in the middle of the forest. You should get the same, the same qualifications. So the learnings of this uh, uh, talk is basically with a project that Ericsson has done that is called Universal Connectivity Management. And the idea was how to, for example, if you have, like, as I said, 600 million SIM cards, how do you manage those 600 million cars? And then basically they came up with an API based on microservices. And we use basically Kubernetes to, to run the shop. So it's a project that was created in 2017. Uh, we built a lot of tiny microservices. These microservices can be completely rewritten in two weeks. So the services can never be in bigger than, than two weeks uh, code, basically. And they're based on a pattern called entity control boundary. I'm going to display it. So basically, this is a very old uh, software pattern. And we have the, the boundary, which is what is exposed to the clients. Here we have the control, which is, acts as a delegator. So once uh, a request comes, if the microservices can fulfill it itself, it will call the entity. If it cannot, it will call another microservice and then self responds to the boundary, which it will restore it to the client. So, and then the entity manages the connection to the database. So if the, re the, the request is small and it can be satisfied with this data, then it will feed it back. The, like in every technology, it's good to apply certain, uh, how to say, strategies or, or learnings into this. And the first um, important is actually the, how do you, do you break microservices. So we use a decomposition strategy based on, on the, like the technical gains we had. And the most important was, was the functional, the business capability, and the subdomain. The microservices also talk a lot to each other. So the inter-process communication is very important. And uh, the other part we have was actually how to deploy microservices. So in the past, when we work with a monolith, you can deploy like, in, like every year or every twice per year. In microservices, you have to deploy every week. You need to move to a fully automated, full deployment, continuous delivery. And the last part is going to be testing microservices. So I think everyone is familiar with this concept of having like a big problem and trying to break, break it into smaller parts. So that's basically the foundation of microservices. You start looking at big chunks, and then you try to, to break it into the smaller part as possible. And later on, you will have actually uh, dependencies between those like, uh, smaller parts to each other. So in the past, for example, you had, as I said, like a set of components. And those components have to be deployed together. And those components uh, make the system quite kind of slow to deploy and difficult to maintain in some situations because the different teams of different components have to be uh, synchronized with each other. This is good in some contexts and, and bad in another context. So if we apply, uh, how to say, functional decomposition to this uh, old system, what we'll do is we break each part into a small service. And the focus is that one thing should be do only one task very, very well. Then the other critical part is actually avoiding any kind of synchronization. So it's very easy to write uh, synchronous calls. And in a microservice architecture, everything has to be asynchronous to, to be performant. Otherwise, you end up in a kind of distributed monolith. The other thing that is critical is to have data isolation. So it's very important that each microservice is only responsible of its own data. And after we have applied this, then basically the result is the following. You have three microservices that they have their own database, and then they talk to each other uh, through uh, orchestration platform, for example, Kubernetes, or uh, you can use others as one. Well. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, basically the result. So the benefits is that each, uh, uh, each microservice can have a dedicated team. 
so you can move much faster, you can deploy really fast, uh, you can produce a lot of code. The, how to say, the isolation makes that you can do continuous delivery, so you can release every time that a feature is done, uh, you, you can move on. We have seen Sharat now doing this for Oracle, basically. So Oracle wants to make a, a cadence release every six months. So it's very important to deliver software very fast to customers. And the critical part also is that you, every, every microservices has to have a customer value. So if a microservices doesn't have a customer value, considering removing it or, or dropping it completely. So the, that's another key factor of microservice architecture. Like you need to think, okay, do we have all this code? Does it actually provide any value to the customer? And in, in a monolith, when you have like millions of lines of code, it's difficult to tell. Um, when you have a microservice architecture, you can see who is calling the service. And you start asking questions. Does this get called by a customer? Does the customer is willing to pay for this? And if not, then you just remove it. This is a little bit what, what I said. Uh, it's very easy to run when you start creating microservices. It's very easy to run into dependencies. So you create microservice A and you create a dependency to microservice B. And then if you really go far, you end up with thousands of dependencies. I'm going to show a, a picture that I don't have in my presentation. I, I'll continue with that later. Uh, uh, but basically, when you have like thousands of microservices, the picture I wanted to show was uh, when Netflix and uh, Twitter, they, they have created over 60,000 microservices. Then you start getting dependencies to like critical services. And those services become very hard to remove. And the communication between the services is complicated. Uh, but what basically, I, I don't know if anybody has worked with Unix. So in the old Unix systems, you have one thing called inter-process communication. And microservices and inter-process communication of those systems are very similar. They share many of the same uh, qualities or properties. And basically, uh, when you have like two services calling each other, then uh, you become dependent on that. And it's very hard to remove from a system. So when you start having this kind of dependencies, one possible is like you, you replicate data or you replicate services. Uh, this tends to result in distributed state. And distributed state is very, very hard to solve. Uh, there are many solutions, there are many commercial products, there are many patents and so on. But I have never seen a company handling distributed state in a, in a good way. And in our project, this was a nightmare. We had to like many different attempts to try to solve this for once. And I'm going to show some of the solutions we tried. So the first solution is to replicate like small poles of data. And this works a lot for when you have like tiny pieces of devices. It, it works well at the beginning. And uh, you can use asynchronous calls. So what you do is you take a small, like a small database and then you take one line of that database and you replicate it. And then this becomes available to or, over several people. The problem is when you have to modify that data, then you have to propagate the changes. And that's actually very complicated. Now let's talk about deploying microservices. So, uh, as I said at the beginning, when you move into microservices, you have to fully automatize everything. You cannot rely anymore on manual processes. There is very little time, like if there is a failure at runtime or you need to redeploy a service or something crash, uh, the system has to react on that automatically. And it's very important or critical that, uh, how to say, Every, all the task in the system has uh, like first automatic test and then there is scripts to, to run those those uh, changes at different times so one way to deploy it is uh, to have like a multiple service per host uh, this is a uh, like I would say whenever people start moving to microservices this is how all the companies they start at the beginning you have like uh, easy code, uh, easy changes, and this is very efficient and very fast. Uh, 
the problem with this is that there is no isolation. So all, all the services are sharing the same GVM. And uh, the database and all this relies on the same server as well. So if some uh, service crash, it's very likely that all the other services will crash as well. And it's not really uh, fault tolerant. The other uh, version of this is uh, actually, how to say, to have a service instance per container. Uh, and you can say that Kubernetes helps a lot with this, uh, and it's a kind of orchestration. So the great thing with this is that you have a super fast startup time, so you can spin many instances and you can make them react very quickly. It provides service isolation, so if this instance dies, this, it doesn't impact the rest of them. And uh, how to say, the only problem that you have is that, as I said, you need to think about security a lot, and it's kind of complicated to orchestrate the instances with each other. Uh, this is the one that we're using currently now. The other thing we learned from this project was that um, we, we try at the beginning, everybody is familiar with the parameter of testing. Like uh, on the top you have a septum test, then you have integration test, and then you have a big platform of unit test. So this approach didn't work very well for us uh, because the unit test never provide us answer if this is gonna work well at, in production. It told us that, yeah, this microservices is working great in your computer, but when you deploy into production, we found a lot of issues is like when you are like testing several microservices at the same time. The unit test doesn't provide any good answer for, for this. And what we tried was, uh, so this is like the kind of all approach of testing. And uh, I think, how to say, the majority of the people are using this. Uh, we look at one, uh, another approach that is, comes from a, a guy called Asaf Mesica. And he provided uh, his company called Lox.io's. They're using a, a diamond approach or in inverted parameter. And what they do is like you reduce a lot the amount of unit tests. You just focus on, I don't know, really critical functionality. Then you have like larger amounts of component tests. And what is critical here is large amounts of integration tests. You need me to sh make sure that everything works with Docker, everything works with uh, the database, everything works with the uh, different uh, Kubernetes versions. And you have a fairly large amount of end-to-end -end tests. And these tests will provide you the answer if this works in production or not. That's, that's the biggest lesson of this, is that the more end-to-end -end tests you have, the more likely you can predict if this deployment is gonna work, if you're gonna face any data issues or scalability issues, this will come at end-to-end uh, -end test phase. And that's why I said that everything has to be fully automated, because these tests are usually very slow to run. And they are very complicated to write. Uh, you need to like mock or set up many things. Uh, they're, they're kind of challenging to, to write. But nevertheless, we fi find that this approach is much better to work with a microservice architecture than, than the old parameter of testing. And uh, it's very important to have it in place from day one. Uh, if you, this is something that is very hard, it costs us a lot of time to change the um, how to say um, to change the mindset of the developers and the people. It, it took really some time before we we grasp it, but once it was in place, this was great actually. And for uh, creating this uh, IoT platform, we use one thing called MicroProfile. So you saw today Josh uh, speaking about Spring Boot and uh, how to test there. Uh, MicroProfile is the uh, response of the Java community to Spring Boot. And it's a library that is right now in the version 3.0. And it has been designed to support microservices. So the many of the different, uh, how to say, components of the library, it helps you a lot to test or to deploy or to take care of microservices uh, problems. 
So uh, whenever you develop, uh, how to say, uh, microservices, one critical part in our project was the, the um, dependency context, uh, the CDI, that is very important to, to have. And also, you need to have certain, uh, how to say, for example, uh, components out of the box that it saves you a lot of time. For example, health check, if you want to see a microservice is responding well or it's being well, all this uh, comes with the framework for free. And it's, it's uh, so far very good for, for us. Uh, yeah, this is not going to talk so much about it. The other part, like for example, Spring Boot, it only has you basically Pbottle as a company. So if you get Spring Boot, you're, you, you have kind of like one dependency to Pbottle. In, in the case of uh, MicroProfile, there is a series of like implementations from many different companies. So IBM has, for example, Open Liberty. Uh, Pajara has its own uh, implementation as well. And then uh, Tommy has also a MicroProfile implementation. So you have many choices for running MicroProfile. So let's say that, I don't know, for some, for some reason you don't like uh, Red Hat, then you can change to IBM. And if you don't like IBM, you can change to Tommy. So you have many choices to, to run MicroProfile in, in this. And yeah, the, they basically, like, you can have a look at the different and try which one is, it suits you better. The benefits of using MicroProfile for us was that, for example, the it comes with the embedded REST client API, which uh, provides us with type safe invocation of your microservices. So when you run microservices, you run a lot of things through a network call, and then you kind of lose type safety. Uh, thanks to MicroProfile, you can get this type safety using the library. The other difficult part of microservices is actually uh, op op uh, searching or debugging for uh, errors. So once you, you start deploying a lot of services, if you need to debug, in the past, you could just uh, connect remotely to your container and uh, try to find the errors. In microservices, you have many services running at the same time. So it means that you need to basically have another strategy for debugging. And that strategy is based on, on basically tracing logs, audit logs, and uh, uh, trying to correlate the IDs to see who did what at what time. So it is much more challenging, it's more complex. Uh, usually requires uh, a lot of tools, like for example, Kibana, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, and so on. But uh, nevertheless, as I said, if you're using MicroProfile, it's kind of good to try to get as many uh, uh, things in the compiler as possible. Uh, as I said, uh, how to say, mm, MicroProfile has uh, is now I think in version 3.0. Uh, this is the website that you should have a look and download it and try it. There are many companies who who support this. Uh, the version of uh, how to say uh, of that Josh was talking about, we have exactly the same page in MicroProfile. Uh, and uh, there are many speakers uh, from the Java community uh, talking about the benefits of running microprofile architecture. Uh, my favorite is Ibar Grimsta. He has run many specifications for, for the um, uh, Eclipse Foundation. Uh, Andre from Payara, he's also a, a great speaker and uh, uh, evangelist about microprofile. And also as well, Roberto Cortez from uh, Tommy uh, that now has changed to another company. Well, a small uh, how to say recap of uh, how to say what we have learned from uh, this uh, project. The first one, what that distributed state is very difficult. Uh, it's an old problem that uh, many companies or many people have tried to to do with. My suggestion to you is try to avoid it as much as you can. Um, don't don't try to replicate data. Uh, Try to like maintain like small databases with no replicated state anywhere. The second part that uh, we had problems with was the CDI. So when we run uh, like libraries inside Java, then we have clashes between the different contexts in dependency injection, and this was very hard for us to solve when we have duplicated uh, dependencies. And what we did is uh, we duplicated the code. 
So we uh, avoided this issue uh, by duplicating code in microservices. And it's not a good practice in reality, but it was better than having the CDI problems in production. Then uh, for us, what we decided is to change uh, to diamond approach. And uh, this has improved the, the testing part a lot. Uh, it's controversial, like there's still people in the project that don't like it. Uh, they prefer the old fashioned way to, to have like a lot of unit tests. Uh, but I, I think this uh, brings more, more value for testing. And also, um, in the past, uh, I don't know, projects, uh, usually the developers had a lot of power, meaning that they were in critical uh, decisions. There was an architect who knew everything. When you have microservices, the, the, the architect becomes a like, kind of bottleneck. So you, there is, it's impossible for a person to cope with so much code and so many uh, different libraries. And what happens is that at the end, the, what it becomes very critical for your organization is to have a good DevOps. A person who knows how Kubernetes work, uh, that have a deep knowledge of how the containers are orchestrated, uh, many distributed algorithms, and the DevOps starts emerging as a powerful uh, figure inside the, the microservices. So the, the system architect kind of maybe phased a little bit, and the developers work in, in kind of quite simple microservices, so they don't have that much to say in terms of the architecture of the entire system. But the DevOps, they need to make sure that all the microservices work together and they work well and they're performant. So uh, you can't d uh, run microservices without powerful or knowledgeable DevOps. And many organizations, when they shift to, the, to microservices, they think, OK, let's just run code and the developers will fix everything. Well, yeah, it is true, you can do that, but in the long run, you will need people that are very familiar with how Kubernetes deployments work and uh, the problems that usually have a runtime and yeah, th these kind of things. Um, so for our project, what we are gonna do now, it's uh, we are testing one uh, platform based on GraalVM called Quarkus. Uh, Quarkus uh, provides super fast uh, startup time. And uh, this is also very critical when you are running microservices. Then you need to have, uh, like, a system should boot if possible in microseconds. You can't wait uh, minutes uh, as before. Especially in telecom, the, the companies are trying to achieve what is called the, the five nines which means that a system can be down only a few s seconds per year. And uh, I think, no, actually, two, it's around two minutes the a system can be down per year. And to, to achieve that, well, basically, if you have services that start in microseconds, then, yeah, you, if anything goes wrong, you can re just reboot the system and, and keep running. The other part is that for testing, we use one thing called Archelion. And, uh, and with hopefully with Quarkus, we're going to be able to move from uh, Archelion to the full setup in Quarkus. So uh, Quar Archelion is a kind of like mock, but for containers. So you, it allows you to mock different dependencies that you have for microservices. But the price you pay is like, quite slow sometimes. And one way to, to do this is to set up the whole thing in, in Quarkus instead and running the, the conversation there. Um, I went really fast. Uh, I'm sorry for that, but do you have any questions? If we have the library, does this cause a problem on the deployment process? I mean, because when we build a service, we always have to ensure the dependencies, the draft file are updated. Uh, yes, so... Uh, one tricky part that uh, you have with the dependencies is that you don't get notified when uh, the things are out of, uh, of version. So a developer could deploy a whole version of a service that is not compatible with the latest uh, service. Uh, and, and this is uh, kind of tricky that there is still not really good answer for, for this. So you need to keep this knowledge in the developer's head uh, of the versioning. And maybe a change log uh, is, is good to, to know which services are calling each other. 
Does it answer your question? Yeah, just somehow we have to monitor the updates by ourselves. Yes, uh, at least for the moment, <laughs> until okay. some other library comes. <laughs> okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, welcome. Yes. Uh, you you mentioned that uh, the uh, basically uh, your your test you you think that integration test is more important because the on uh, production we have to cl collaborate with other microservices yes. so it uh, it doesn't make sense that I, I write the simple unit test but uh, how could how could your uh, integration text works uh, because for example I. Uh, uh, when you when you are running your integration test, are you connected with other, for example, production microservice, or are they have a clone version in, in also in the the integration uh, test environment? So the way to do th this is a bit tricky. Uh, so depending on the setup, we, we are running on the cloud. We are running in Azure, and what we did is we took the production environment and we created a copy for testing environment. Uh, and then we reduce the hardware. We, we have the, the hardware is not as powerful. There is not as many processors and run memory in the testing environment as there is in production. So, uh, but the configuration is exactly the same as production. This is very important. Uh, then the second part is that in, in production, we don't, in the testing environment, we don't have any real data. So we have uh, only like bogus data or like uh, anonymized data that is not reflecting production. Uh, in Sweden, we have to be compliant with one law called um, uh, GDPR. And then the, the third part that is very important is uh, you, might, you might mock c certain parts. So for example, we're using Keyclock for authentication of the users. And then um, in, in some cases, you don't need that. When, when you're testing some microservices, you don't need the entire key clock running. You just uh, send a token, and uh, the, you, you, un you suppose that un the token is correct, because you don't really care if, if the, um, the key clock is up and running or not. So in the testing environment, you need to like, have different configurations for what dependencies are relevant for which test. So when you're running end-to-end -end test, uh, then you have to have the, the entire system up and running. And this is very memory consuming because you need to have Keyclow up, you need to have all the databases up, you need to have maybe third-party integration systems up. And this is the part I was saying with Archelian. So Archelian help us to, to, do, to mock this kind of services. So um, depending on how you configure it, as I said, you, you might get very close to what production is. It's never 100%, but it's quite close to, to production. And the, the other part that is in, uh, important is actually the, the response time. So when you're using Archelian, the response times that you will get are different than the ones you will get in production. So the timeouts, um, the, the locks or the data racing, it could be different there. And the um, the important part is to like mock the right thing at the right time. So when you have microservices calling each other, there are microservices that are important and there are microservices which are not. And then you, the, you, you, you rely on programming discipline or the knowledge of the developers to mock which one is relevant for, for the test case. So you need to have a lot of uh, test cases and a lot of scenarios. And you need to have both positive testing and negative testing. Does it answer your question? Uh, yes, I, I have further question. Yes. That's, uh, 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 because uh, integration or end-to-end uh, -end test is more important to use, but, but uh, because uh, running that test is more time consuming than, than unit tests. Correct. So, and, and you mentioned that you have many of that case, and most likely they, they cannot be rolled back. Like unit tests so, uh, for, for the database access, we can roll back, but uh, because it's closed close system access, you cannot roll back the transaction. So, uh, uh, it, it, which means most likely you cannot run it parallelly if you have, uh, for example, update or something. Because there is a dependency, how how do you manage this? You need to be able to run the test in parallel. Uh, it's difficult to achieve. It's, it's very hard sometimes. So for example, some of our integration tests are sequential. 
but we always try to run them in parallel. Um, I, I cannot really provide a good answer because the, the, uh, the answer is it depends on your system. But the go if you are doing a system from scratch, you should always try to make it in parallel. Uh, in reality, uh, w once you have a real life system, the answer is you can't do that. Because to, for example, if I'm buying a product in, the, in a web shop like Amazon, then first I need to, to select the product in the cart. And then once I have selected the product, then I, I can pay. I cannot pay before the product hasn't been put in the, in the cart. And this might be seen as a two different, like browsing and collecting products, it might be seen as a microservice. And then the checkout, it might be another microservice. So the, it, these kind of parts are tricky, but what you need to do is uh, isolate these two test cases and reproduce the scenario inside. So if I'm buying a product on Amazon, then this should be the precondition that there is a product inside the cart and then I can run the, the test for uh, the, the checkout. But as I said, this uh, maybe is a, you know, like a, a trivialization of what in reality this becomes very complicated once you're trying to reproduce the same thing with your unit or with Archelion. Thank you. Welcome. Yes. Uh, thank you for your great talk. Oh, uh, thank you. Okay, I want to know many people use uh, Spring Cloud ecosystem yeah. yes. to develop microservices. Yeah. Could you compare micro profile and uh, Spring Cloud ecosystem? Thank yeah. you. So uh, Spring, uh, to be make to make this fair, uh, so micro profile is similar to Spring Boot. Uh, the the cloud part it's uh, like an implementation from Pivotal. And then uh, MicroProfile doesn't have any opinion on what kind of implementation you should use. You can use it in Azure, you can use it in Amazon, you can use it in Pivotal if you want. MicroProfile doesn't really care where, where you run it. But the, the specification of Spring Boot and the specification of MicroProfile are very similar in terms of functionality. Uh, Spring Boot is more mature because they started first. Uh, I would say that the, the difference is that MicroProfile has more support f maybe from the, the community part. So there are many people involved uh, from different organizations like Eclipse, IBM, Red Hat, that are supporting MicroProfile. While micro, uh, my Spring Boot is more uh, it's open source, but it's a proprietary solution from Pivotal. And uh, I mean, there are, there are people who have opinions against this. I, I'm not part of that opinion, but what I meant is that for some companies, they think that there is a risk uh, for, for just working towards one company only. So it's a choice that you do when, when you select this. Uh, ma there are many customers very happy with Pivotal. Uh, there are also many customers happy with uh, MicroProfile. And then you need to look at your requirements as a company. What do, do we want to change implementation uh, very easy from IBM to Red Hat or from Red Hat to Payara? If this is a requirement, then uh, MicroProfile is uh, more suited. But in the case, if you're running a Spring Boot, basically you can only use the stuff from Pivotal. You don't have that many implementations to, to run. Okay, thank you. Hmm. More questions? I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions. like. How many people are using microservices? Oh, quite a lot. Uh, I'm happy. I'm very happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, how many people are considering to use uh, microservices? Uh, what's the biggest problem, in your opinion, to adopt microservices? Anything? <laughs> Okay, sorry, distribution, yeah. I can say the following, for us, the problem with um, adopting micro profile was, uh, oh, sorry, microservices, it was actually, uh, the, the we need to change the entire um, the software pipeline. So it took us quite some time to move to a new way of delivering software so fast and so efficient. Because everybody, I used to work with two releases per year of software. And to change the mindset that, you know, every change that you put, it takes two hours and it should be in production. 
uh, it took a while to, to grasp or to understand like, okay, whatever you do is going to be in two hours in production. So it, it's a different mindset for people and it takes some time to, to get uh, used to this change. The, the other part that I wanted to mention, uh, it was not part of the presentation, was that in microservices, you can change Java versions very quickly. So we started with Java 8, and then we decided to move to Java 11. And what we did is that in our Docker image, we replaced all the Java versions from JDK 8 to Java 11 without having any problem at all in production. So this is something that, um, and I spoke to Sharad about this uh, as well in the presentation, you should uh, move uh, the, if you're using Docker, you should move to the latest Java version all the time. There's no reason to, I mean, you as a code, you can remain in Java 8. There, there is nobody pushing you to, to move to Java 11, but the, the runtime, it should be always the latest. Uh, and I have se never seen at any customer having problems running the latest uh, Java with, with uh, Java 8. So this is something that Java is very powerful. You can take any JDK and all run like Java version code 1.1 and it will still work. So uh, if you go to, for example, C Sharp, you cannot run the C Sharp 1.0 in the latest C Sharp that you have now. And Java has managed to maintain this backward compatibility and it's very valuable for, for customer companies. So. It, if you have a company that is running Java 8, you can always maintain the syntax of the project in Java 8, but in production you can run, you can use the latest JDK, JDK 11, uh, 14, what, whatever you like, but try to push because the difference that like people said, well, but there's no difference then. And I said, there is a huge difference. The first one is the security updates. So using JDK 11 in production will give you all the security and the most important, the performance uh, updates. So in Java 9, there was a feature called Compact Strings, which introduced, and what they did is basically create uh, binary strings. So if they did, Oracle did a, a study of uh, the strings in the JVM, and they find out that around 60% of the strings are actually uh, less than eight bytes. So they created a binary interpretation of that string. And then if the string is bigger than uh, eight bytes, you will have a full Unicode string that takes a lot of memory inside the GBM. And by doing this, uh, you reduce the memory by 10 to 20% in the GBM applications. So if you are running cloud, this means a lot of memory, really a lot of memory that you can save by, by running the latest Java version. So I, I cannot uh, release the numbers we, we save in, in our project by moving from Java 8 to Java 11, but it was, a, it was in the numbers of thousands of dollars we save every month just by switching the, the Java version. And the, every like, uh, bad practice in the cloud is very expensive because whatever mistake you do is gonna cost you either CPU or memory or hard drive. If you move to the latest uh, Java 11 or uh, whatever version you want to choose, you will get all the security updates and all the performance updates. Well, thank you very much uh, for attending. Uh, I'm available after the talk for more questions. Thank you very much.